What scares you? Nothing. I was the last of uh, maybe 10 kids that she had. Five from the previous marriage and then five that she had with my dad. And doctors told her, you're taking a, a big risk if you have this child, you know. There's going to be some serious complications, possibly even death. And she had been operated not to have me. And she, she still chose to. I mean, she could have terminated the pregnancy. But uh, she was stubborn about it. She refused. If I had to ask that saint one question, it would be why. Why did you pick me? I thought it was normal to just have a father and sisters and tons of nannies. I didn't start realizing that, I guess, till you know, you know, years later in my life. But if you want to say up until to my father's death, I pretty much thought everything was was okay, and I pretty much was like any other kid in the sense where you know I wanted to play, I wanted to have fun, you know, I had a big imagination. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be everything. I wanted to be Muhammad Ali. I wanted to be Sugar Ray Leonard. I wanted to be the champion of the world, be able to raise my hand. I wanted to be Elvis Presley. I just wanted to be liked. I wanted to be accepted. I just wanted to be loved. But I do got to admit one thing. There was always a feeling that I had that I couldn't explain. It was always with me and I might have kept it a secret. There was a sadness to me ever since I can't remember. And I mean as far back as four years old, three years old, when you start remembering things. It could even be in the midst of a celebration or somebody saying happy birthday or after my father died. Sadder. Sadder. As far as I can recall, I remember hearing the word uh, functional and dysfunctional. I've been told maybe when I was in my teens, that I always grew up in a dysfunctional setting. I remember hearing that hearing that word, dysfunctional. I guess up until the point when I, when I lost my dad is when, uh, you know, I could say that's when all the changes in me came in. I grew up around Hispanics, Ukrainians, Polish. There was a fair balance there. And uh, yeah, there were gangs, there was drugs, but when you're young, you don't realize that. You think those are your, you know, these are your everyday people. These are your friends. These are uh, relatives. These are neighbors. These are people you interacted on a, on a daily basis. I think with me was because I was I was pretty protected by my by my older brothers and uh, my sisters. Well, wow, especially my sisters. I wanted to get a taste of of whatever, but everyone else told me I, I shouldn't be doing, or I should stay away from. I led myself into a lot of things I did. Um, you know, nobody came and pointed a gun in my head and told me, you need to be in this gang. Um, probably more the other way around. I'm like, you need to put me in this gang. You guys don't know what you're missing. And they thought it was hilarious. And told me, no, we've been told by the family to, to leave you alone and you need to stay away from us. So I probably might be a rare case. I might be the one kid who came into trouble and said, hey, you guys need a guy like me around. The worst day of my life was in April 1982. That was the day my dad took his own life. He owned an after hours spot, a little bar, and uh, he wasn't there. The doors were locked, the windows were locked from the outside. So and it had padlocks and everything, so everybody thought, you know, hey, he's not around. 
I was home watching the cartoons. And as I turned around, my sister was right there and she put her arm around me. Let's go. We got to go. She looked like a mess, like she had seen a ghost. And she says, after today, I tell you what to do. I take care of you. I'm here for you. I'm like, Nada, what's going on? And she's like, just do as I tell you. Please, just do as I tell you. Let's go. I go, no, no, no. I remember that. We'll just tell you. Just like, I thought for a minute there, could it be that I did something wrong in school and she's taking me to my father and I was going to get lectured and punished or something. So as we reached closer to this place, I seen people swarm like ants. They started a clear passage. I finally ran past everybody and I remember slipping on a pile, a puddle of blood. It wasn't water, it wasn't oil, it was blood. I remember falling on the floor and uh, might have been the coroner or the cop or whatever grabbing me and saying, this kid shouldn't be in here. I saw my father, um, I saw my father laid on the ground with, uh, Half of his head was missing. The worst thing, worst thing you could see. Then I remember my sister holding him, and them trying to get my sister off her, and they couldn't. I couldn't believe it. It was like some straight out of a horror movie. My sister was red from head to toe with my father's blood. I think the, the death of my father made my life. I think that's the reason I am the man that I am today. And uh, throughout the tears and everything, I think I learned more from the man in his absence than I have in his presence. It made a man out of me. Being the youngest, I probably gotta admit, I was like uh, I'm the baby, so I was I was spoiled, you know. I pretty much got my way, but uh, I, you know, I had to respond to everybody. Of course, I had to respect everybody, or else I'd get my little ass whooped. Julia's my my oldest sister, and uh, I got a lot of my uh, taste in in music and in my desire, my passion for knowledge and had my drive, I think, from from Julia. Nada's probably the reason why I'm a fighter. You know, we didn't have a mom, just our dad, you know, it was us, and there was always someone challenging or something disrespectful or something taking place in the neighborhood. And I remember my sister rolling up her sleeves and going out there and humbugging. So when I say that, you know, I picked up that trait from her, is that I remember she was always a fighter, but she didn't come to the trouble. She let the trouble come to her. Papo! William, my brother, he may not know this, but I want him to know this, that I studied him. I studied him, I watched him closely. And, uh, and a lot of my ways, I picked up from him, the good ways. Flora was a tomboy growing up. She didn't like boys, she didn't, she didn't want boys complimenting her. She wanted everybody away. She was really into sports, anything they could do, she could do better. And you know, she kicked a lot of ass. And that was kind of cool, you know? Saved us the trouble too. I remember the first time she got really girly, started fixing her hair and the makeup and the dresses and the whole nine. It was like shocking to me. I was like, oh, uh oh, I have to ward these fellas off. I love all my brothers and sisters in their own unique way. Maggie, Margarita, named after my mother. That changed my life. Up until the day that uh, my daughter was born, there was a big debate if 
she would even be my daughter because it was just a bunch of us kids in the neighborhood. I'm talking about, you know, 14, 15 year old kids. We'd hide out with the girls and kiss and play around, whatever. And I guess there was a big whole deal with the whose kid it might be or whatever. I remember Patsy telling me, Patsy's the mother of my uh, first daughter. I only said it could have been someone else's to protect you. I didn't want to get you in trouble, but you're the only one I was with. And after hearing that, I knew to be around because I believed her. Although as a kid myself, there was a big mature spot inside of me. The grandmother of my daughter early on, you know, asked me to sign rights away and say, and she told me, you know, hey, you know you're kind of young, barely eighth grade, going into freshman high school, whatever the case was. I think you ought to let me take care of her. And you'll still be able to see the, you know, see the child and have something to do in her life when you're old enough. But, you know, you guys are just kids yourselves. And I remember me not even thinking twice of saying, yes, ma'am, whatever you say, and giving her consent and permission and signing away for that. So pretty much for the first couple years of her life, it was more of a, on a permission or invitation only basis where, where I show up, you know, to certain holidays or birthdays or whatever, even even though she just lived next door. I was still this young man cutting the law, playing sports outside and running around and then looking over like, oh, oh that's my kid. carpet, putting it in my backyard with four big broomsticks and some rope, tying rope around that and uh, having two sets of boxing gloves. And I remember inviting everybody and their mother, literally, <laughs> to come over and box. I'd match kids against kids, women against women, grandmas against grandmas, grandpas against grandpas. I guess I was, you could say I was a little Don King without even knowing it. I was called an instigator back then, but Today, I find out that that's called being a promoter. So basically, I was promoting fights at a young age and didn't even know it. It was a lot of fun until the first day I had to get in the ring myself. And I remember, you know, a kid maybe four years younger than me dazed me. But after that day, I decided to take boxing kind of serious. I was a late bloomer in boxing. I had some martial arts background and experience and stuff. But the first time I ever, you know, had an officially sanctioned bout, I might have been 20 years old. I won the Golden Gloves in the middleweight division, Chicago Golden Gloves middleweight open division champion. When I won the Golden Gloves, might have been 27. Sonny was the first influence I had into the martial arts, into wrestling. Here's the guy who changed my diapers at one point and everything. He might have been 18 when I was born. It's a big brother. That was a that was a guy who drank milk all the time. Didn't smoke, wasn't into drugs, was into racing cars and motorcycles and, and sports. And it was kind of like, you know, like a childhood idol, if you will. I had my brothers, but my brothers going through the same things that I went through. So they actually kind of looked up to Sonny as well, too. Who is the trainer that was the most influential in your boxing career? Sam Colon has been my only boxing trainer for my amateur career and my professional career. I was a kickboxer before I met Sam Colonna. That trainer had passed away. It was named Kevin McClinton. His nickname was Super Kick, and I, I learned quite a bit with that with that fella. He was a good guy. He died of a brain tumor, and uh, it was the only reason I, you know, I converted from kickboxing to boxing. Otherwise, I probably would have stood a kickboxer and stood faithfully and loyally to Kevin. He hooked himself with the fella who's pretty much done everything since then, which is Sam Colonna. Some of my favorite fighters were uh, Jermaine Saunders, 
call him Silky Smooth, uh, Anwar Shana, Angel El Toro Hernandez. What fight uh, are you most proud of? Frankie Randall, call him the surgeon. He was the first man to dethrone the legendary Mexican legend Julio Cesar Chavez. He was like 95 and old with like 77 knockouts when he faced a uh, kid from uh, Birmingham, Alabama by the name of Frankie the Surgeon Randall. He might have been like 44 and 2 or whatever. It was the first man to beat him. So for me to beat the man that beat the man, a legend, that was a big deal to me. We fought twice. The first time we fought, I lost the first fight. Second fight, I uh, I knocked him out. What do you think of before you go into the ring in a professional? How do you prepare yourself? I've never really feared having to go in the ring with anyone. So I, there's really no preparation. I mean, there's times that I've taken naps or played a game or something, a tic-tac-toe or something before I went inside of the ring or sat there and cracked jokes or whatever the case was. I, and I guess I just looked at it as like I'm about to in, in, you know, engage in, in a sport like anything else. I guess I really don't have any type of preparation other than the fact that make sure I was in, I was in good shape and I gave it my, my best effort and uh, tried to outwit the person that I see in front of me. Let's get it over with. Last couple of fights of my career, I was taking fights on, you know, spur of, spur of the moment, you know, three week notice, uh, unprepared fashion, you know, relatively low amounts of money. You know, my mind wasn't right. I, I was just fighting just to fight because I was a licensed fighter and I, and I was a prospect at one time and it was just something that, that I wasn't even in love with anymore. It was just something I was doing just because I could. Basically, I could say is uh, I probably wouldn't be the man I am today if it, if it wasn't for Jackie, the mother of my two sons. I actually didn't start any form of relationship with her until I was 17. She was literally the girl next door, and you know, I'd see her come and go and I always wish that you know I could be that I could be that fellow who, who was holding her hand. Now I'll never forget the big crush that I had on her. To 
think that I, I'd wind up being with her for half my life. It's like, wow. I love her more and more every day. Fidelity thing, you know, how she handled the uh, the first time I fucked up. I guess my conscience was killing me. I couldn't live with it. I came clean, you know. I had to break the news to her. She's devastated. Not to be proud of at all. She don't deserve that. It hurts me to even talk about it. What makes a great teacher is a great student. I think what makes a, uh, a good trainer is a good fighter. And uh, I mean, I've been the greatest fighter in the world. But I think I've been a fighter since the day I was born. In and outside of that ring. I've been on uh, the winning end, the losing end. Just as much losses as wins, and I guess uh, a fancy word for uh, mistakes and losses is experience. So I think my experience helps, as well as patience. I've been told I'm pretty patient. care about people because I because I've always wanted people to care about me I guess I try to do for other people what I've always wanted people to do for me Tell me about R. Kelly. What impact did he have on you? Meeting a fellow like that, a six-time Grammy Award winner, a millionaire, a performer, it actually taught me that people even in, in, in that scale, and that level of life, are just like you and I. So I guess it, it, it kind of helped me because uh, I always wanted to be this, you know, this star myself or whatever, to be famous and rich. I mean... Who doesn't long for that? How it how it helped me meeting him or what impact it had on my life, I wanna say that it, it showed me that, you know, they are people too. I remember the first time R. Kelly stepped into the ring and had his first official fight, his first official boxing match. I was scared to death. I did not want nothing to happen to him. I says, here I here this guy is that I convinced to get into the ring and take on one of these matches. I mean, all of his people that were behind him, that had all this money invested in him, the record label people, whatever, they were they were scared. They were paranoid. They were like, wow, this guy has this, you know, million dollar pipes there, those vocals. If anything can happen to this guy, you know, it's curtains for me, you know. This guy is in the ring. You know, I've trained him so long, he's having his first fight. I mean, this is this is this is the real deal. And yeah, I was confident in my training ability and what I did for him. But the other guy across the ring there, he was in for the kill, he meant business. It was it was exciting to have him have his first fight, me working his corner, knowing that I taught him everything he knows and here he is getting in the ring for the first time. I'll never forget that. The first play that I ever did, I might have been 11 years old and I played Jesus Christ. It was for an Easter play. And I remember the blanket that I was wearing getting caught on the makeshift cross on the prop that he had and us falling and it coming off and me being sit me sitting there in my fruit in a loom. It was I mean it was hilarious and my fake beard falling. I remember in Sunday in Sunday school that, that just all went wrong. But yeah, the first uh role that I ever played was Jesus Christ. I started auditioning and getting all these all, all these different uh roles. And like I said, my favorite role was uh, titled, The Sun Always Shines for the Cool. I played a hustler. It 
was a slick talking guy by the name of uh, Willie Bodega. The playwright was Miguel Pinheiro, Puerto Rican playwright, who was a junkie. You know, I had to wear this big yellow wig, you know, and this uh, polyester pants that were so tight, bell bottoms, you know, the whole the big polyester collar and everything, and I had to do disco dancing and stuff. Gave me an opportunity to, you know, to let my hair down if you want to go crazy. You know, matter of fact, uh, here's a scene right now. For somebody to ask me what's next, I don't know what the future holds. I just want to know that I'm making a difference now. That my life and my mother's death wasn't in vain. I want to know that I helped somebody, that I wasn't a waste. If you could, what would you have done differently? I would have probably broken less hearts, would have made wiser decisions, treated women better, set better examples. I got a problem with just being satisfied. But uh, I'm working on it. What concerns me about kids today, the people they look up to as role models, little guidance, very minimal guidance. What advice would you give kids today? Listen, do what's right. I miss this. What do you miss about it? I miss the whole challenge being in the ring, you know? Uh -huh. Been uh, out of the ring for almost two years now. And, uh, you know, I have my moments I miss it. I wish I was in there working behind the scenes a lot, getting everybody else ready. And, uh, you know, not a day goes by that but I don't feel it in my heart like that. I can just do it a couple more times, you know what I mean? I want to be in there, but it's not about me at this point anymore. Any chance you might uh, consider doing it again? I don't know. I don't know. Only time can tell. You know, right now, it's just a dream. It's not about me. Like I said, it's about working behind the scenes and helping everybody else do what I wasn't able to do.